Hi folks, I'm Jack Kennedy and welcome to week six of Farm Tech Talk. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the support of FBD, MSD Animal Health, Ornua and Borbia in bringing this outside broadcast to you. For this discussion, I'd like to welcome our beef editor, Adam Woods, our dairy editor, Aidan Brennan and our sheep and schemes editor, Darren Carty. <clears throat> I just want to flag at this stage that we're going to have a separate session with Justin McCarthy, Phelan O'Neill and Katrina Morrissey on, on, I suppose, some of the big stories that hit the headlines this week. There was a lot of talk about EU payments coming to Ireland. There was a lot of talk about, I suppose, details of, you know, the, the first 100 days, the first 100 days of the Ag Commissioner in Europe and how he has performed. Um, I also talked to, and many, many livestock uh, viewers and readers will know that I talked to... Um, or be as Mick Hulhan about the quality assurance scheme and some of the changes that are coming down the lines in terms of the quality assurance and in terms of a new scheme that Bor B are going to bring out in the in the in the new future with we've, we've details on that. So all that is in the other session that we're recording in Farm Tech Talk this week. Um, so our intention with this with this livestock session is to have a kind of a deep dive into breeding given the week that's in it. It's late April, breeding has started or is just about to start on most farms. So at first, I'm going to talk to Darren and Adam on the suckler side of things, and then I'm going to move it, move on with, with Aidan Brennan, and I'm going to talk to MSD's uh, Fergal Morris, and I'm also going to talk to the former boss of ICBF, Brian Wickham, who, was going to, who we put a call into this morning from uh, New Zealand. So we, we, we dialed up Brian over in New Zealand, and we had a chat with him about the last 20 years of the, the EBI and where it is. So a very busy show. Um, Darren, if I start with you, um, Galway man, you're keeping you're keeping a tight eye on the new for demonstration farm there it, in in Chagas Athen Rye. Maybe first, before you get into the breeding side of things, maybe give us a little bit of a background to the kind of the trial and the herd that's there. Yeah, Jack. So the new for uh, demonstration farm is set up now for four or five years. It was originally formed by Chagas and Dawn Meats, uh, and then we came on board, and it's also supported by McDonald's as well. So it differs slightly, I suppose, maybe to your conventional suckler system in that it's utilizing a first cross uh, cow from the dairy herd. And uh, there would have been a lot of work done in the past on the limousine cross cow, but nothing really, I suppose, maybe in the Hereford and Danga side of things. So it's 100 cows. Uh, the heifers in recent years have been contract reared uh, coming in from, say, the dairy herd. Uh, and it all been selected on a combination of, I suppose, maybe sire type and also on the Eurostar figures. So Everton has brought you to beef from it so far. So there's 100 uh, cows uh, are in general been running maybe 100 to 110 uh, with the aim of having 100 cows of grass during the year. Uh, they, I suppose one of the big targets on the breeding side has been to try and improve the quality of the progeny. That's, we can see that there's a few things that the first cross dairy cow gives us. It gives us lots of milk, there's no issues on that. It gives us fertility and the big challenge is to bring beef characteristics to the table. And just to be clear, Darren, before we get into the breeding again, it's it's steers, right? There's no there's no bull beef, there's no young bull beef, it's it's all steers and heifers. Yeah, so uh, a lot of people would have said, and this is one of the, the things that would have been maybe Put, put to us in the past is that if you were going for the most profitable system that you'd be going for an under 16 month bull and and that has been the case in recent years we've seen that to the Chagas Irish Farmers Journal of Better Farm Programme is that that system has come out on top uh, but uh, I suppose the target here was to see what could be done and what could be achieved in the steer system and also in a heifer system the big targets is trying to maximize or trying to finish the maximum numbers of cattle off grass. So the target at the outset of the program was to finish roughly around 80% of the progeny off grass in the second year. That has been, a, I suppose, an area that we've fallen down on for one reason or another, either whether it be uh, weather has been challenging to, to complete that, but also I suppose that when you're improving the genetics of the animals, and in particular improving the genetics of the steers, is that it's harder to get them finished at that sort of 18, 19 months of age. We've seen them generally finished from October to to December in recent years. The heifers we have been able to finish uh, a percentage of them off grass, but the big challenge there has been on carcass weights. Uh, and that has been a limitation of the project is that heifers 
we're finding it hard to get over that average of 300 kilos carcass, uh, which then puts pressure on output. But on the steer side, we have been able to bring them through to heavier weights. Last year, steers were the average 360 kilos uh, carcass weight. But the problem on that is we didn't get into an expensive indoor finishing period, and it does hit the economics of the system. Okay. Um, okay. So that's a nice bit of background on some of the challenges and some of the issues that you've had over the I kind of said you over the last couple of years. If we were to Tight, tighten in now on the breeding side of things. Breeding is starting Monday. I suppose, how, how is the herd set up for it now this year? Yeah, the herd is set up well, and, and that's something that it's been a big success story of it. And there's, like, there's been a lot of things that we can take from the project that, yes, it has its, cha its challenges in terms of finances, but breeding is one area that has excelled. And we've seen that that first cross cow from the dairy herd, uh, fertility is very good on her, provided that she's looked after during the winter and also that she gets out to grass early. And that's something the current manager, Eola Collins, is focusing on. And it has worked in previous years. That when the project started off, we had three stock bulls and it was seen that we would run uh, three stock bulls over 100 cows. The first year we had issues in this bulls getting hurt or bulls not working. And over time, what we did was we switched to AI. So it's a full AI in the 100 cow herd, which is also, I suppose, maybe a challenge or different than the Norman farms. Uh, but the big thing, I suppose, is having cow condition right. So the, the, the two things that would have been done in recent weeks is that cows would have been all body condition scored. Uh, cows that were maybe running slightly behind uh, condition score targets. And in particular, they would generally be first or second calves. They were bunched into their own uh, group and they were given a bit of preferential treatment. They weren't just grazed just as hard. So now all the cows are back to the new for block. There's 100 cows run in two groups, uh, two batches of 50. And that's just to facilitate, I suppose, maybe grazing management, but also in, in the ease of getting animals into the yard for handling. Uh, also, I suppose, maybe the, the other big thing that would have been done in recent years is a lot of focus on sire selection and calving ease that there be, would be no subsequent problems in breeding with regards hard calvings. So calving has just finished, uh, and I suppose that would give a, a wrong view of that we have a very long drawn out calving period. Only six cows have calved since the middle of March. Uh, so we're looking at this year, maybe tighten up the breeding season more. Uh, in recent years, we've got anywhere from 60 to 70 percent conception to first service and we've generally had over 90 percent of the herd bred or conceiving within the first six weeks so it's been tight enough going and has been and has been good the other i suppose maybe big take home uh, from the project in recent years has been once a day ai now the dairy lads will be well used to that yourself and aiden and how that's working but for the sucklers that was a new initiative really and what we've we've seen that working for the last two years is that cows are ai'd once a day at 12 o'clock. Any cow showing standing heat in the evening is AI the following morning. If she still is the uh, same way any cow showing standing heat in the morning is AI at 12 noon. If a cow is still showing standing heat that evening, they are AI to begin the following morning. And some farmers will say, Jeannie, that's going to be an awful lot more straws. In general, what it has been is somewhere to the tune of 15 to 18% of cows maybe receiving an extra service. But it has paid its own way in regards reducing labour and also in reducing handling, getting them 100 cows if we have to pull a few cows out into the yard. Okay, I mean, the, the big question, I suppose, and a good part of the trial is like, how, how are you picking those AI sires? How are you picking, you know, the, the, the bulls to use on those first cross dairy animals mainly? Yeah, so I touched on that slightly, and uh, in this calving ease is, is major, Jack, on it, and also brief credentials. So the first aspect, and we've, we've increased this over the years, so we started off at the outset of the program with less than 5% calving difficulty with a young herd, but we have increased that to 6% two years ago for mature cows, and last year and this year, we're pushing the boat out to 7% calving difficulty for mature cows. Young cows are maybe cows that... Uh, wouldn't be as big in stature. They are somewhere around 6%, and for first calfers, it's less than 5% calving difficulty. So that's the big one, first one. The next one we want is to bring, as I mentioned, better beef uh, characteristics to the table. And we focused on carcass weight. Uh, and for the, for the last few years, we've been looking at greater than 30 kilos of carcass weight on the ICBF Your Star Index. 
uh, for, say, mature cows and is greater than 25 kilos for heifers. We've also increased that this year to 35 kilos. It predicted the carcass weight for mature cows. And what we're looking at more this year as well is confirmation. Because what we've seen in the last few years is that uh, even using the best bulls on the, on the active bull list, that were falling down in regards to confirmation when cattle are hanging up. That generally what we've been getting is an R grade in steer, an R grade in heifer, when we would like to be pushing more of them into that sort of U minus category, U equals to try and bring animals up on the grid and, and increase the payment. So confirmation is an area we're going to look at a bit more this year. Uh, and we've widened out, I suppose, maybe the bull selection team this year. Last year we would have used uh, mainly Hidiel, uh, Fiston and Bivouac. Uh, Hidial calves look very good on the ground at the minute. We've had fisting for the last few years, and they're, I suppose, maybe a, a real good straight calf. And what we've seen so far this year is that some of the bivouac calves are good, but some of them are turning into real leggy type of animals. Yes, they will bring weight, but on a planar type cow, maybe not to use it. So we're, we're bringing in, say, some more limousine sires. There's a bit in the mix this year and that's i suppose maybe another part and aspect is we were not uh favoring any one breed we put in the data into the icbf index and whatever bulls come on top that's what we go with uh, and we don't mind that so we've seven bulls this year for the mature cows and we're back to uh, lm2014 uh you and dale Iver for uh heifers for the first for the first calf heifers and that is uh really delivered i suppose in recent years we had EBI two years ago, but we found that LM2014 is just adding a bit better calf quality and more carcass weight to the mix. Okay, so, I mean, you've given us a good flavour, I suppose, of what's happening in, in Newford and, um, you know, the, some of the challenges, but again, where you're pushing the boat out now in terms of sire selection, etc., and that kind of thing. So, hold, hold it on that. I, Adam, if, if, I, if I come to you next in terms of, I suppose, Tullamore Farm, you're, you're finished calving as well, and I suppose breeding is, breeding is next on the agenda for you down there. Yeah, one cow left to calve, Jack. There's always one straggler, I guess, in every yard. And um, so just waiting on one cow to calve. And yeah, breeding is starting today, actually. Uh, and the cows started in the heifers uh, last week. Uh, he has 17 heifers uh, AI there so far. Um, and yeah, cows, cows, I was down there yesterday and cows are coming in heat. There were three cows in heat there yesterday. Tell me about the cow, the cow type that you have in, in Tullamore Farm. Uh, you know, I mean, again, I suppose there was some criticism at the start of the trial that you, you were kind of, you know, the cows weren't good enough, etc. and that kind of thing. Give us, a, give us a flavor for the cow type that you have now on Tullamore Farm. Yeah, I guess, Jack, the majority of the herd is a black limousine cross from the dairy herd. It's getting harder and harder to get them, we say, from a British Frisian type cow with the, with the whole scene, uh, influence in the, in the dairy herd. Those limousine heifers aren't as good a quality, but we've a lot of them down there. Um, and I guess on Tullamore Farm, we're not looking for this big, muscly, show type cow to look at. It's nice to look at good cows. But we're looking for a cow to do a couple of things, to have milk, uh, to be easily calved, uh, be good on condition score, not be hard fed, I guess, be around sort of 650, 670 kilos. Um, be docile um, and just be a good functional cow and that's that's what we have we're starting to keep more of the replacements from those cows so we put limousine and semix on those cows and the second cross is really coming into its own now because the quality of cows i think is increasing every year down there jump into it then in terms of what what, what kind of stage you're, you're at in terms of breeding or i suppose what's happening down there in in terms of bleeding or what the plans are for breeding next week yeah, so Sean went out there about uh, two months ago and bought three Vitek bulls. So we've two groups of cows and we've a group of heifers. Uh, we've a group of 51 heifers there. They're a mixture of our own heifers and we've purchased in some black limousines as well. Um, the two groups of 45 cows, they've got the, the vasectomized bulls have a chin ball on them. They've also got this new heat collar. It's, it's a product where, where they wear a collar. It recognizes when the, when the vasectomized comes to Sean's phone. So... We want to can down there, supposed to reduce labour and reduce Sean's time. So that's one of the ways, and it has worked quite well. Um, and we've also tail painted the cows. He tail painted the cows yesterday. So there's a sort of a, a couple of areas there that are going to really make sure that we pick up heat. Cow condition very important, and cows have been grazing out for the last sort of four to six weeks, and, and cows are in really nice condition for breeding. And as I said, heats are coming in there quite strong. He has 17 heifers at a 51 bred uh, in the last seven days. Adam, you were down with Sean there yesterday and you grabbed a few shots of what the cows are like and what's happening in the farm at the moment. I was Jack and catching up was, was the thing I was doing. I was running around after him for a while, uh, tail painting cows and we, you can see now what he had to say. Yeah, we're uh, just tail painting the cows here this morning. Um, we've sort of been pre-breeding for the last uh, month, just taking a uh, record of any heats we see from the cows. Um, so 
we've just been getting their vaccinations in as well and we're going to tail paint them now. Teaser one will be let out this evening um, with his moo call collar on and we'll start the uh, AI in cows tomorrow. So will you have to top up this, we'll say as you go, or will this do, we'll say for a long time? Or? Yeah, we'll top it up as we go, but as a cow breeds, we'll start off in this colour. And when this cow is bred and the tail paint is go gone, we'll change that probably to red. So when we're out in the paddock, we'll know cows that we've already bred. And you'll see progress throughout the breeding season. And you'll know a cow repeating before you, you have to look up at the eye book. This isn't the only heat detection aid you're using, you're using moo heat as well. Yeah, with moo heat as well, and we'll probably throw a chin ball on the bowls just for backup. Okay, thanks. Nice to hear that, Adam. Um, in, in terms of the AI job now on, on, a, on a suckler farm, I know that it's a full-time, says you, suckler farm down there, like there's someone working full-time on it, but a lot of guys are far, part-time. Like, I mean, would you would you be not as well kind of let, letting out the stock bull and kind of letting and forgetting about the AI? Or, or what happens on the majority of suckler farms? Yeah, Jack, I suppose stock bulls, I, I still have nightmares about stock bulls on Tullamore Farm. Uh, if we go back to 2017, in terms of a stock bull not working and, and the scanning day was, was a bad day. Uh, in terms of cows not being in calf, but it is, I suppose, we're around 12% on, in terms of AI calves from the suckler herd. It's low, uh, and I suppose part time farming is, is, is because of that, because farmers aren't there, and stock bull is, I suppose, the, the, the bull of choice on a lot of farms. But we just see on Tullamore Farm in terms of the, 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 the piece that genetics brings to it in terms of AI bulls and proven bulls, and those very high replacement index bulls. I don't think we'd ever get a proven bull. We, we couldn't get the reliability in a stock bull to grow for cows there. And that's why we're using AI. We want to we want to position ourselves to be breeding the very best of heifers and very, very high index heifers uh, from AI. We've seen with the heifer sale for the last couple of years, our AI sired heifers are, are commanding a premium in the marketplace. And that's probably because a lot of farms haven't got the availability of AI heifers. So, so they're looking to buy them when they go to that sale. I mean, is there anything you do, uh, you have done in terms of making it easier to bring the cows in from the fields? You know what I mean? In terms of getting them into, for, into the crush, etc. for AI. Like, is there, an, is there anything you think are good things that a, a sucker farmer should do to make that job easy? I guess we're working, Jack, in a paddock system. And we also have Nico down there. Nico is, is, is as good as two men out in that paddock in the morning with Sean. And Sean will try his very best maybe to sift off a couple of cows, not bringing in the full group of 45, but... Paddocks means that the cows are moving, I suppose, on every couple of days. So if Sean goes in in the morning to take cows out of that paddock, maybe they think they're getting the move. And they get used to going back up to the yard or whatever, maybe they think they're getting the move. So look at good infrastructure, good fences and a good yard uh, to be able to sort them out once they go up there. They're all very, very important for AI. Okay, all of those. And, and Nico is a good dog, as you say, as well. Um, so in terms of AI, picking bulls, picking AI sires um, for the suckler herd, I presume when you just look at the nice pictures in the catalogues, like what do you do? We, we, we do, Jack. We, we, there's a couple of catalogues here in the kitchen and they fold out every night uh, to look through them. And, and they're great. I, I love doing that. And, but, but it's not all about that, of course, being serious about it. We need the index. We need, we'd say, highly proven bulls. And we also look at the pictures and we look at the breeding behind those pictures. Um, I guess on Tullamore Farmers, we're matching up maybe a weakness in a cow with a strength in the bull. And, and Sean's really into his breeding in terms of looking at what cows have bred in the past. Uh, whether they bred good heifers or whether they're better suited to maybe some breeding, maybe a bull calf. We can't dictate what we get in terms of male or female, but we can, I suppose, punt in terms of what, what type of an animal we want to get out of a cow. So we, we went through the cows yesterday and we picked out bulls for each of them. The majority of our high replacement bulls are limousine and semental. And what we found in the past, really they need to calve down in the first six weeks. So in the first two rounds of AI, we'll concentrate on, on high replacement semental bulls and high replacement limousine bulls. And then for the last three weeks, uh, we'll go to Charlie because those Charlie heifer calves, uh, we found for the sale in the past, those younger calves aren't commanding a premium uh, as, as in-calf heifers or as maiden heifers. So we move to a Charlie and, and we'll, we'll be able to finish those out. I guess in choosing those high replacement bulls, we're not just going to the top of the list um, and picking the very, very extreme, maybe high replacement bulls. We have one bull there that's up at the top. That's awesome because he's also got good terminal traits. We're trying to be conscious that 50% of our, our animals on that farm are, are going as bull beef. We want good terminal traits in the bull as well. So we're trying to pick a balanced bull. QCD, for example, his index is around 160. His terminal index is 150. Another example is LM2016. Again, a good replacement index and a good terminal index. And another example is Corahine Earth. Um, a very, very high replacement index, but also good on carcass traits. So, so that's sort of where we're at in terms of picking out the bulls. Some of the black limousine cows, we're trying to go with limousine on them. Maybe keep the heifer off those and go with Semental back on them again. In terms of the maiden heifers, what are you doing in terms of kind of picking up those in heat? And, and again, what, what kind of sires are you using on them? 
Yeah, so, so on, on the Maiden Heifer group, we're quite a large group, 51, and we just spoke over it yesterday in terms of picking up heats in that group. It's, it's, it's quite difficult because the group is very large. We do have a, a, a new heat on a vasectomized bull in that group as well, but it's, it's hard to, I suppose, the, a lot of the heifers congregate around each other and maybe you, you, get, you tend to get a little few maybe false heats in that. So the 17 heifers that bred, what's going to happen today, you're going to pull out those 17 heifers, uh, let them out with the Solaire bull in a different paddock, so it reduces the group size uh, of that big group of heifers, so it might be a little bit easier to pick them up, but tail paint and the vasectomized bull is the two biggest things there. Okay, um, like Adam, that, that's good. We've had a good we've had a good chat around kind of I suppose what's happening on Tullamore Farm and, and as you say mixing and matching the sires with the cows etc. And um, we'll leave it at that for the moment. I might come back to you, um, Darren. If I come back to you just to finish off in terms of the sheep side of things, in terms of markets this week, I suppose, and and what happened in the lamb trade. I mean, I see some good news on the on the on the lamb front. Yeah, it was, I suppose it's been a whirlwind week, Jack, and really if I say a whirlwind last weekend because. Prices jumped by 30 to 40 cents on the back of tight supplies and demand for the Ramadan festival. So that started on Thursday. Uh, and I suppose maybe look at uh, the quotes would have maybe slightly gone back from where they were at the start of the week, but they're still well ahead of where they were this time last week. And there still is strong appetite there from, from factories. So you're looking at spring lamb, quotes are around 6.40 a kilo, excluding the quality assurance bonuses. And hoggets are generally the base quotes around six euros a kilo. So there is farmers getting a touch above that, say, depending on negotiating uh, power. But I suppose the, the two big things that I look forward to are to say that factories are saying for the next week coming is that for farmers to continue to market cheap as they come fit. That's uh, really, I suppose, that what will be dictates uh, the next few weeks is for us to have a competitive advantage, we need spring lambs at the correct weight and also hoggets at the correct weight uh, and also factories have said that they will pay a bit extra for these and that they've now started the discount on heavy overweight hoggets but more so on light spring lambs that are coming in under 16 or 17 kilos and that are coming in without flesh and they really i suppose farmers got maybe a bit worried on that the market was going to fall but factories are saying look at supplies that and that awfully strong uh, and that there should be a good trade for them. Adam, in terms of the, the beef trade in both the factory and, and, and the marts, what's, what's the story, what's the update for this week? Yeah, Jack, in marts, we, we've seen that really strong trade continue. Uh, grass buyers were out in force. I guess that good weather and good grass growth uh, has been seen a bit of an impetus to get stock on the farms. That ANC, I suppose, payment, you need to graze stock for, for seven months for that. So obviously farmers out buying for that. And the factory's a little bit more life in the trade as well. Um, some processors towards the north have had to give a little bit more maybe 345 350 to get stock a little bit of resistance at 340 to sell stock with some farms and to be honest a lot of farms we've seen it in the kill figures the kill figures are down again a lot of farms has let out cattle out to grass and that's probably reducing the amount of cattle that's coming online so a little bit of steadiness there we've seen those fast food chains open up again for for dry through so it's all tentatively positive uh, in the beef market Right, lads, I, I might leave it there with you, Darren and Adam, because in fairness, like you've given us a good kind of flavour for both the trade and I suppose the breeding side of things in terms of what's happening in Newford Farm from, from Darren and what's happening in Tullamore Farm from Adam. So um, good to hear that things are on track. And as you say, there's a little bit of positivity returning to the trade and both the sheep trade very strong this week. And as you say, Adam, some maybe some green shoots appearing on the on the beef side. So thanks for your time, lads, and we'll be in touch again. Aidan, if I, if I jump straight into you, um, obviously it's late April on the, the dairy side of things, the same as it is for everyone else, same as it is for everyone else. Um, farmers down south, I suppose, will be starting breeding now late April, whereas up the country, it, it is that, you know, they are that week or two, I suppose, after the rest, like, you know, so, I mean, um, it, it's, it's good weather and it's, it's, good, it's a good week for grass and everything to kind of start off that breeding job. Yeah, uh, cows are in good condition and the weather is ideal. It's suiting cows, you know, they're getting their full intakes of grass and they're displaying really strong heats. But I suppose back on the, the timing of AI, Jack, you know, you need to think about next February, then the next January, like what's the weather going to be like then? And while it's good now, you don't really want to be uh, having cows calving in, in bad weather. So as you say, up the, the northern half of the country, when it's a little bit later, they won't start, start breeding until the first week of May, which I think is still the right thing to do. You know, um, you'd want to have a lot of grass. You want to have... 
an early farm to be starting AIing uh, this week, I would say. Yeah, good job. Um, so I, I, we had a couple of farmer queries in in terms of prostaglandin and drugs and vaccinations, etc., and that kind of thing. So I actually rang Fergal Morris early, MSD's uh, Fergal Morris earlier, and I just put, put a couple of queries to him that came in in terms of farmers and some of the issues that they have around breeding. So let's hear what he has to say. Delighted to be joined by MSD's Fergal Morris again. Fergal, we have a couple of queries that are coming in from around the country. I might read out the first one. It's from a, a cork farmer. Um, I've started watching my maiden heifers on an out farm and I'm breeding to standing heat. I was going to go in with a shot of PG after a week. Is it day six or day seven for the injection or does it make a difference? Yeah, it's very important in terms of the time that you give uh, a shot of prostaglandin. So if you look at what happens uh, when the egg is released uh, from the ovary into the uterus, um, after five days you get the the corpus luteum forms, which is, it's the yellow body it's called, but it produces progesterone. If there's a pregnancy, uh, the, the corpus luteum is retained and it continues to produce progesterone maintained in the pregnancy. If there's no pregnancy, uh, the corpus luteum breaks down and you get another egg released. Uh, so there's a period of five days where it won't respond to, to prostaglandin at the start. And there's also a period of five days at the end. So there's 11 days in between where it is effective. Uh, so for that reason, we'd always say leave it at least six days. Good. Okay, that's clear. That that's clear. Um, second question: I've just landed two Hereford stock bulls onto my farm for cleaning up maiden heifers after AI in four weeks' time. So these have just these bulls have just landed on the farm. He doesn't want them straight away, but um, he wants them in four weeks' time. I have them in a paddock on their own. Is that quarantine enough? And what do I need to look out for? Yeah, I think it's certainly a very good idea to quarantine for a period of time because animals, you know, can arrive on the farm and then they can, can get sick after they arrive. I think one of the big ones would be IBR. That's certainly something that's very contagious. And you'll see that, uh, you know, within a few days after they arrive, but they can spread it to the other animals in the herd. There's also potential that they can be uh, infected with things like leptospirosis, which can cause severe infertility. So it's probably best if you don't know the history of the animal to vaccinate definitely for uh, leptospirosis because that can result in about a 20% reduction in conception rates. It's the most important one this time of the year. And once that's done at least two weeks prior to the, the breeding season, there, there's no issue. Um, one that's probably worth considering still is BVD. You know, BVD, uh, we've done a great job in Ireland in terms of getting rid of the persistently infected animals, but it's still circulating. And it's a little bit like coronavirus. Uh, to try and get rid of some of these viruses, you probably need to vaccinate in some cases, especially if you're not sure of the history. So BVD is another one, and leptovoid and BVD can be given at the same time. And the final one that, that is worth considering is IBR. Um, unless the animal is, is going for, uh, for, for uh, going to an AI station, uh, IBR is worth considering as well, because it is extremely contagious. We talk about yeah. a reproduction, sorry, yep. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no. I mean, you to be, effectively you've answered the second part of that question. There was actually two far, two parts of that farmer question. That he said the he actually told us the farmer where I bought them said he's not vaccinating for anything, um, but the herd where they've landed they vaccinate for BVD, IBR, and lepto. So he and his question is, am I st like so? These are four four weeks before he needs them, and he's saying, should I vaccinate them now? And effectively, for, from what I've heard from you, you're saying yes. Get in with your BVD, IBR, and lepto now. Um, and you'll still have to, you'll get your booster shot in before be, before they actually are released with the heifers, won't you? Yes, and IBR is a single dose. And one of the advantages is that you can actually mix BVD uh, and IBR combined, bovulus BVD and IBR. You can mix the two of them and give them at the one time. Uh, so that's a single injection for IBR. Then you need a booster dose for BVD if they're not unvaccinated. Leptovoid, you'll need two doses. Um, so that's uh, two doses, uh, uh, two weeks apart. And again, <clears throat> Um, two, uh, sorry, three to four weeks apart. And in the case of leptovoid and BVD, they can be given at the same time as well. That's cool. That's, that's, that's straightforward. So he should go ahead with do, and do it now. And he has time, the fact that they are four weeks from, from before they join with the heifers. Uh, final question, I'll just read it out here again. Um, I've trouble keeping heat detection stickers on heifers. What are my options? It's a very good point. Um, and at this time of the year, you might still have a winter coat and hair is the problem. So if you've got uh, rough hair in particular, that's uh, that's loose and dirty, try and remove that. Uh, and, and sometimes even to clip it. 
Uh, we've all got good at maybe clipping hair uh, at this stage. And one of the things that you, you can do is do, don't do a zero or a one, basically. Don't, don't cut it too tight, but you can clip the hair. Uh, you can certainly use glue uh, in some cases to try and hold the, the, the stickers in place. And stickers are definitely better for heifers than tail paint. That, that, that is the case. The other option is the monitors. So there's, there's two types of monitors. You've got the collars, but there's also uh, ear tags. And the ear tags can be very effective in heifers. Uh, the monitors, the, the, the collars mainly are used for uh, cows and they tend to look at both health and fertility. In the case of the heifers, you can just, they're slightly cheaper. So you can pick the ones that just focus on, on fertility. And some of those are extremely accurate. Right, Aidan, we heard from Fergal there about, you know, giving that shot of PG, maybe day six onwards to those maiden heifers. That, I mean, it's, a, it's probably the most common piece that farmers will do in terms of trying to minimize drug usage, yet get some kind of compactness into the maiden heifers, because a lot of them are on out farms and that kind of thing. Would you agree that is the kind of the most common method? Yeah, I think it's I think it's the best track to be honest. Uh, like you're you're minimising the amount of of, of hormones you're using in, in the animals, and yeah, you're getting a, a high rate of of a high submission rate, which is good. I suppose some people then they'll also do maybe you know you're not going to get a hundred percent of your heifers, you know, even after doing that the six days of natural heat plus your 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 ones that you're getting PG, you might still have ten or fifteen percent aren't yet served. Some people will go back in on day 18, so day uh, 18 days after breeding, and inject those again. It's just a little uh, added extra if you want to make sure that you're going to get all your heifers to at least uh, to, to get a shot of, uh, of, of AI. Um, it'd be one way to, to, to help ensure that. But look, after six days, the shot of PG, it's, it's good, it's effective. Um, I think it's the way to go. Yeah. You were telling me yesterday that you were putting stickers on, on your maiden heifers. How did that job go? Grand gesture. It's very easy to do it, Jack. You know, you just wipe down the, the any bit of loose hair, uh, give it a bit of a, a rub down. Um, I was using the the AI tags. You know, to come in a roll, and you uh, you but you need to put the, your spray on it adhesive on the heifer first. Let it get tacky after you know thirty or forty seconds, and then put the sticker on. Uh, I put the tag on. It's not actually it's not actually sticky. Um, look, it's very easy to do it. I, I suppose I went out then last night to look at them again, and she's those heifers. The little devils like they're pulling them off. <laughs> There was one heifer in particular, you know, I was watching her there and she was well able to get it off. Um, so I went back today then, I, I changed a few of them, I used a different type of a product. I, I, I won with a sticky a sticky back uh, scratch card, you know, so you let the heat that heat up and then put them on it. Uh, look, there's no easy way, I suppose, with the heifers. Like, I, I'd still say scratch cards are better than tail paint. They're more, you know, it's it's more it's it's easier to, to to activate the scratch card than it is to get the tail paint rubbed off. But there's no there's no um alternative really to watching them. Like you still need to watch them even if you're using those heat detection aids. But yeah, it's difficult, Jack. But I mean, look again, it's a short time. Like you're only going to do the six or seven days and then PG them, so they'll all be coming in then. But one thing I suppose I, I do intend doing is uh, removing the ones that are bulled and taking them elsewhere after, um, you know, the day after that they're ai So what I AI today, I'm going to remove them tomorrow. Um, at least it will reduce the amount of animals that need to watch in that field. Yeah, you're dead right, yeah. In terms of cows, so that was, that's the maiden heifers you've been talking about. In terms of cows, what, what, what heat detection aids are you using on the cows? Uh, just tail paint, ordinary uh, everyday tail paint, um, and, and topping them up there probably every five days or so. Um, that's that's a simple, simple and, and effective for the cows, yeah. Are you are you doing anything else in terms of you know once a day milking or you know or maybe tell us a bit about kind of breeding charts and that kind of thing how you're kind of managing that piece kind of in terms of getting getting you know making it easy for both you and the AI man. Yeah, so I suppose the in terms of once a day milking, uh, lay calving cows, I, I you know putting the share of them on once a day milking, so just to reduce the stress on them uh, and make them return to cycle cycle activity faster, you know, uh, because th those cows could be okay. They're they're generally in good condition score, but we don't want them to lose condition score. So putting them on once a day, uh, okay, it's going to affect the bull tank a little bit, but, uh, but the plan is that they'll they'll come back in calf uh, earlier in the year, and I'll gain that next year. Um, yeah, look, with the breeding chart done out there, it's up on the wall. Uh, it's easy to see what what cows are getting what. Uh, look, simple things like, but just making making life easier, being a little bit organised on it. Um, that's basically all we're doing. You know, cows are showing good heats. Like, you know, we, we you can see they're, they're pulling strong, and they're, you, generally you'll see cows in a group. You know, you're, if you're doing heat detection, they'll be in the, the cows that are bulling to be all in a group together. But it, it's easy spot some cows. It's the cows that are in that group that aren't maybe bulling yet. Are they coming into heat? Are they coming out of heat? They're the key ones, like so. It's always it's always those ones I'd be looking out for when you're looking at a group of cows. 
Yeah, so I mean, as you say, that's where the, the the notebook, the heat detection comes in, actually kind of being in the field with them, we'll say, especially during this very busy three weeks and just take, taking down everything that you can in terms of, you know, numbers, etc. Is that, I mean, is there any other tips like that, like we'll say at this time of the year that you kind of, that you, you find successful? Um, again, you can't beat monitoring them. Like, so in the evening time, the 9, the 9 p.m. little walk around the field, look, uh, when the weather is good, it's an enjoyable little little bit of a walk because conditions are good and you're looking at cows and, you know, you tend, you tend to like looking at cows. Um, it's watching those ones like that. You know, the, the New Zealanders say there's a sag. You know, they call that, that a sag. Like, you know, there's four or five cows bullying in the group. But it's those cows that are part of that, maybe that, but mightn't be mounted on. Um, but they might be just hanging around like they're the ones that and they might only get one or two mounts and the, 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 the tail paint mightn't be gone at all on them or you know might only be a fraction of it gone but if you could see those bullying you might say or you know in that activity group you probably trends are showing them and 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 it might only be half the time you're right but jesus the, 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 that that 50 percent of the time that you are right that's a valuable heat to get because we know there's a huge cost to miss heat, like it's over 250 euro for every time you miss a heat. So very valuable, I'd say. Yeah, you're dead right. Um, okay, I think we've enough on the kind of fertility management side of things, and we've touched off it in the last couple of weeks, and we, and again we'll touch off it again, I suppose, in in coming weeks. I mean, if we were to kind of jump uh, jump aside into the kind of I suppose straw selection, because a, a lot of look, it's fair to say a lot of farmers will have straws selected at this stage, especially those that are kind of in the DIY space. We'll say and doing their own AI, they'll have frozen straws landed on the farm already. But there there's still a lot of AI to be used on farms that's used fresh, you know. So the the farmers will ring up and ring up the uh, AI company and and look for fresh semen. So again, you want to try and use the best fresh semen that's available. So I, I said, look at it, with we, there's a lot of talk about indexes and uh, genomic sires and cow size and all that kind of thing. So I said, who who could we talk to that would be kind of I suppose you know independent to some extent or at least not involved in the current game. So I, I said we'd put a call into Brian Wickham. He's the former boss of the IC, ICBF, the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation. Um, he's over in New Zealand at the moment. He's manager of the New Zealand Animal Evaluation Unit at the moment. So we had a chat with Brian about some of those issues. Um, you know, around the index, and is it the right way to go around genomics? Are they the right sires to use, etc.? So, look at listen to this, you'll be interested to, to listen to this, and, and I'll come back to Aidan for a couple of comments afterwards. So, Jack, the, the EBI and the BW, I mean, they're doing pretty much the same job um, EBI for Ireland and the BW for New Zealand, um, and you know, the EBI has evolved considerably since we first developed it and I think we launched it about 2001 was it or 2002 so it's it's, it's close on 20 years old um, and as has the BW and I was closely associated with the BW uh, up until 1998 when I started at ICBF um, their goal is the same uh, which is identifying dairy cattle which in future will generate the greatest profits for farmers. So they are, I think they, they, they share a very common uh, ambition um, and they're evolving all the time. And we've just initiated a review of the BW um, with a particular focus on ensuring it is fit for the future. And I think the EBI has gone through those sorts of reviews periodically. And we are focusing for the BW on a couple of aspects. Um, one of them is the way we arrive at the value we place on the milk components, fat and protein in particular. Uh, currently, it's based on a three-year rolling average of the most recent market returns. And your uh, viewers will know how quickly the value of uh, fat has increased relative to protein. Um, and there's a real question, certainly in my mind, as to whether that does, in today's values, reflect what we would expect um, when these animals we're breeding today, your farmers are breeding today, uh, will start milking and their descendants will be milking. And I think we need a better way of anticipating the future markets. And I know that was part of the EBI thinking. Uh, so Lawrence Shalou has that uh, lovely model that looks out into the future for the EBI. It's, so that's one aspect that we're having a look at is, is one of the big motivators. The other is the emphasis we place on traits such as 
fertility and greenhouse gas emissions. And both of them, we have the feeling that perhaps we should be giving them more emphasis than we currently do. And there's a I mean, number of other considerations, but that's it's the key the key part of it. And, and the guy that's carrying out the review, Jack, is uh, Peter Aimer and his team at Abacus Bio, who mm. uh, played quite a big role in the EBI mm. and the, of course, the Eurostar indexes, as you're aware. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, it, it is interesting, Brian, to kind of to kind of try, as you say, you're trying to future proof the index to, to try and see ahead, see around the corner. I mean, and it's interesting to say that you, in the BW, you're, you're are, are you saying to me that you are you are trying to increase the fertility on the weighting on fertility um, and as a result, get a better greenhouse gas result because you have less replacements needed and you have longer living cows, et cetera, and that kind of thing. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, no, we, we, the two, there are two things there, Jack. One is fertility. Uh, I mean, the lesson I learned in Ireland when we put the EBI together was that farmers placed more value on fertility than our economic analyses were saying they should. Uh, and I'm, you know, in New Zealand with the BW, the emphasis we put on fertility is based on an economic analysis. And I just really want to know um, whether we are putting enough weight on fertility and perhaps we need a mechanism to get a better indication of what farmers think uh, as distinct from what our models tell us. The The other bit is greenhouse gases which is quite separate from fertility in, in, the, in the, uh, the sense of how we put the BW together. I mean you know greenhouse gas is a growing issue for agriculture and dairying in particular and breeding can do something about it as we all know. Um, if we were to include greenhouse gases based on the carbon prices um, we have today it wouldn't make much difference. So I think there's a question in my mind as to well today's carbon prices are not uh, and not the carbon prices when these animals are going to be producing in the future. So again, it's this trying to get it, uh, get a, an index that uh, better predicts or anticipates um, the economic and environmental circumstances when these animals are going to be producing and their descendants are going to be producing. Okay, okay, I hear you. One of the, I suppose I call it the future proofs of of recent times has been the evolution of genomics and the usage of genomics in establishing, I suppose, these proofs. I mean, there are still Irish farmers that are skeptical on using genomic sires um, and they will prefer to use daughter proven or, you know, non-genomic sires. Um, in terms of New Zealand, there are a number of commercial companies that play in New Zealand. Are they all using genomic sires, I suppose, and, and are they making them available to farmers? So genomics, uh, New Zealand was one of the first countries in the world to implement uh, genomics in their cattle breeding program, and that was the research effort at LIC. Um, it, it didn't necessarily go well, but uh, I think they've learned a lot of lessons, as we all have, uh, Ireland included. Uh, as to how to make good use of genomics. Uh, so in New Zealand, there's two companies that supply a high percentage of the dairy semen market, uh, LIC and CRV Ambreed. They both have advanced genomic uh, breeding programs and they're both using that information to select bulls that they market in New Zealand. Uh, having said that, uh, there is probably a considerably higher percentage of daughter proven bulls still being used in New Zealand than Ireland and than in many other breeding programs. The, the other thing we have in New Zealand, which is really the focus of my work at the moment, is the national body. So this is the ICBF equivalent, if you like, is NZAEL, uh, the company that I'm working for. Um, is responsible for dairy genetic evaluations, but it does not have access to genomic data. Um, and the commercial companies, LIC and CRV, compute their own genomic evaluations. Um, so in February this year, uh, we launched uh, what, <coughs> what I think is the first of two steps to remedy this situation. 
the first step was to move NZAEL onto a state-of-the-art evaluation system. And the second step, uh, which depending on the outcome of uh, current industry discussions, is scheduled to enable a NZAEL to pro start providing uh, genetic evaluations incorporating genomic data from February next year. Aidan, interesting to hear Brian's thoughts on kind of, I suppose, the confusion at farm level when you have different lists, different catalogues, different everything, I suppose, and, and what it can lead to on farm. I mean, do you reckon the majority of Irish farmers kind of recognise the index, the power of the index, I suppose, and the, the numbers that are behind it in terms of the AI, sir, AI sires? Like, I mean, if, if we look at it, still over half the dairy replacements are bred from stock bulls. Yeah, it's a scary figure, Jack. It's it's pathetic. Like when you look at the, across the industry, that about half the, the the cows born in Ireland are you know cows entering the herd in Ireland every year are still out of a stock bull. It just shows that like farmers don't have as much faith, or at least half the farmers in Ireland don't have as much faith in um in in, in EBI as you think, because those cows are on average sixty euros less in EBI than an AI bred um bred bred cow and like that's a huge cost you know multiply that over five or six or ten lactations like that's you know it could be up to 600 euros like on a, on a 10 lactation cows you know if, if, if that ebi correlates to, to profit like so it's 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 huge like um and i suppose the reason for it is a little more than we had to chat with the beef lads earlier it, it's the simplicity of sticking out a bull there and, and you know that's your breeding season done but the cost is huge at farm level and it's an opportunity cost and you see it as was instantly at the moment your fat and protein percent you, you, you know you look across the board look you see in your your milk statement every month what the crop average is uh what your own performance is in and at home relative to that and you can fairly well determine the herds that are using ai are going to be in the top 10 percent in terms of of, uh, of fat and protein percent and and the ones that aren't uh, are, are well down there they're not even getting base price at the moment and we're looking at a milk price cuts you know if you're not hitting base price like it's it's a huge cost to you huge yeah, you're de you're dead right. Like, I mean, it is one of the insulations to the poor milk price piece that's been talked about. Whether it'll come or not, we'll see. But you're right. I mean, the better solids is by far, and at least you know with the AI sires, you know what you're getting or not getting. Um, the other big issue, I suppose, Aidan, is 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 cow size, and and you have heard it in discussion groups, and I've heard it in discussion groups, and some farmers have had this bad experience with big cows and the perceived relationship between big cows and poor fertility i suppose going back kind of 10 20 years ago when we were in when we were importing a lot of semen from other other countries um i i, I said it to I, I asked brian wickham i says like are farmers right to select within the database on size let's hear what he had to say i, I think it's really important to um keep it simple uh, if you want to improve the fertility of your herd using breeding, then select for fertility. Uh, don't try and be clever and say, oh, but it's correlated to size. So if I get is it s s small, or small animals are more fertile, um, there isn't, really isn't much of a correlation with size. Uh, and Ireland, as New Zealand, uh, we actually now have quite good measures of fertility. So select for fertility. And of course, including fertility in the BI, the EBI was what made the difference from the old RBI, which it replaced 20 years ago. Um, that it has worked is so evident in Ireland. You know, I, I often refer to the next generation herd at Moor Park, and it's just one of many demonstrations of how fertility has been improved by using the EBI. Um, if farmers want to select for size, it's also very easy. And the indexes are there to help with that. Uh, but it'd be a really big mistake to select for size in the hope that it would lead to improved fertility. Uh, in short, it will not work and you'll ultimately be disappointed. And the final point I'd make on this, Jack, is that many countries are now reporting a turnaround on fertility without any significant uh, change in the size of the cows. And that's whether you look at the Jersey populations or the mm. Frisian populations or the extreme Holstein mm. populations. These, these two are really not related okay. issues. Okay, I, I, I take your point loud and clear that, that small cows are not necessarily fertile or more fertile. However, some farmers will say that 
okay, they, they actually, they have good fertility and they want to maintain it, but they also want that little bit of extra, maybe feed efficiency or overall efficiency in terms of a vision that they have that a, a smaller cow that can produce a, a kilo of milk solids per kilo of live weight, you know, that, that, that that's an efficient cow for a grass-based system like we have here in Ireland. Um, so am I right in, in terms of what I'm hearing that you're saying, well, if that's what you want, let the, let the database, let the analysis of the database decide that um, rather than trying to correlate size with, with fertility? Jack, the, the EBI is the best guide you've got. Uh, and if I was talking to a New Zealand audience, I'd say the BW for doing exactly what you've described. Uh, animals that will generate the best returns under your, uh, in your environment, your production system, uh, your market for products, milk and meat. Um, the data from farmers is actually speaking to you through the EBI. So I would say listen to it carefully because ultimately it's the data that you as a farmer and your other farmers have provided that's providing this evidence to help you make those really important selection decisions. Aidan, it was interesting to hear Brian, like, kind of, you know, be very clear that, listen, the, the relationship between size and fertility is, is not, a, is, is not there, you know what I mean? That they're not, they're not, and if you're selecting on size thinking you're going to get good fertility, it's, it's the wrong way to go. What, what's your thoughts on the whole cow size debate, I suppose, as, as happens in discussion groups all over Ireland? Yeah, sure, he's right on, on the fertility side of it. Like, sure, we have plenty of examples of, of uh, larger cows, like, you know, the kind of British regions or, or fleck fees, like, or, you know, the, and they've generally got good condition score, or good, good, good fertility, I should say, even, and condition score, obviously, even though they're, they're very big. So, you know, size is not, is not, a, is not a essential for fertility. But what we do see, though, uh, Jack, and he, he, he kind of skirted around it there a little bit, is in terms of the, the, the efficiency of the cow, like. So, you know, uh, smaller cows, they have a lower maintenance requirement, so they're a little bit more efficient. Now, what you'd like to see is a, a cow that's going to produce her live weight in milk solids. Um, and, and it's easier to do, I, I would say, if the cow is a little bit smaller. So for a grass-based system like what we're trying to run here, um, I'd still say size is important. Now, the EBI is good in size. Like, the, if you look at the, since, since 2000, since the EBI has introduced the, the um, average of the of the first lactation cows, those entering the herd for the first time, their maintenance figure, which would be an indication of size, is more or less static at around uh, four, you know, 14 to 15 euros of a sub-index for maintenance. And that correlates roughly to about 580 kilograms of a, of a live weight. And it's fairly consistent, okay, there's small changes up and down uh, year, year on year, but generally speaking, like around a 580 kilo cow is, is what the, uh, if you went, you know, high EBI, that's what you'd be ending up with. Um, so look, it's, I, I think that's that's probably fair enough. Some people would want a little bit smaller than that, um, and more people say it's not big enough. But, uh, you know, you need a happy medium, and I, I'd be happy enough with that as, as, a, as a herd now, you know, in fairness, because, you know, we, we don't need it too big in terms of the efficiency side. And, and yet, we, you know, we still want a, a high fertile animal um, that's going to be able to produce the goods and also produce, you know, have a have a value in terms of a beef side of it then, you know. Yeah, good man. Um, the, one of the final questions I put to Brian was around the database and do, I suppose, do Irish farmers understand the, the value in it? Um, I, I, the, the question I put to Brian was, I said, is the database jewel in the crown for Irish dairy farmers? Yeah, Jack, I'm always wary of analogies. What crown? Um, and is the database, ICBF database, very valuable? Unquestionably, yes. Uh, but the value isn't in the database. The value is in the way it provides information that can be used to make better decisions. So it's ultimately all about uh, more decisions. And I mean, look at the history. In Ireland, it's helped eliminate BVD. It's helped breed more fertile cattle. It is helping breed better beef cattle. And as you know, we're the ICBF and Sheep Ireland are breeding now better sheep. Um, it's provided data for research, uh, which has enabled Ireland to lead the world in the use of genomic technologies for uh, animal breeding, dairy, beef and sheep. 
Uh, the data in the database has established that breeding can improve uh, animal resistance to diseases. Uh, the TB and liver fluke are a couple of examples from Ireland. Uh, you should be very protective of it, while at the same time making sure the value in the data it contains is fully mined. And I'm going to use an analogy. Um, it is the mother load in a mine, uh, worth nothing. Uh, without mining and extracting. Uh, and that's really the, the real value, is uh, going into that database and using the data to help you make better decisions. Right, Aidan, it was interesting to hear Brian's kind of overall positive remarks, I suppose, on the on the database and, and what it brings to the party. Like, um, I mean, it was interesting to hear his his question, like, are, are we fully mining it? Are we getting enough from the database? Like, what? any thoughts on that piece? Yeah, sure. Look, it's 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 a perennial question, I suppose. Um, I suppose for the ordinary farmer, Jack, like the the value of the database is the information that he or she gets out of it. And in fairness, ICBF, like they're really good at presenting that information in an easy to follow way, so we can compare our our own herds against other herds. And um, and the other side of it, then, I suppose, is in terms of the genomics and the value of the genomics and all that information that's in the database around that. And like we know that the EBI, the genomics, is is that good bit uh, a lot greater than than the thought of proven or the stock bulls. So does you know? I I'd say I'd say there's, there's there's a fair value coming out of it that the farmer just isn't even aware of. But my other question is, I suppose, the information going into it and how how good that is. And if you look at the issues of facing farmers at the moment, like you're going to have a reduction in antibiotic usage, you know, there's issues around uh, you know uh, animal welfare or, and all that, and, and, uh, and take lameness as an example of that. Like that's an issue, you know, that is an, you know potentially an animal welfare issue. Are we recording the incidence of lameness well enough in farms, and is that being fed back into the database? Secondly, you look at other health issues such as milk fever. Like again, we know that that's her her heritable. Um, are we recording that? Are we putting that into the database? There's a whole load of stuff that at farm level we're probably not feeding in enough, and only then are we going to get the full value of that. Are we able to mine that database good enough? Uh, we, we, uh, back onto farms then. So, um, uh, I'd say I'd say. To, to sum up, Jack, there's a lot of information in there that farmers probably aren't even aware of, but there's a lot of faith in the ICBF to deliver uh, to deliver the good information that we need uh, to bring it out into farm level. Yeah, I think you're dead right. I think, I mean, and there are a lot of great reports, as you say, from ICBF that are that are there, that are in existence, that a lot of farmers don't even realise that are there, and that show some mm -hmm. some great some great information in terms of what's happening in those herds. Um, but you're right, also, I think, in terms of there's a lot more information that farmers need to be getting into ICBF to kind of, I suppose, take it to the next level in terms of herd health or whatever, like you like you discussed. So, look at Aidan. It's been it's been an, an action packed uh, breeding program. We've had a we started off with the beef and the suckler side of things, and we've We've finished up with it because I suppose a, a great snapshot in terms of the dairy side of things and where it is in terms of currently at farm level and then we de we, we, we delve it a little bit deeper into the kind of I suppose sire selection and the index and that side of things with um with our interview with, with Brian Wickham which is again which was very interesting given I suppose that he's one step removed from the the whole piece at the moment but yes I suppose was deeply involved in the in the start of the EBI and the start of ICBF back in 1998 and when the index first came out in 2000 one so look at uh thanks again aiden for your time and thanks for keep for keeping us up to speed in terms of what's happening on the dairy side and no doubt we'll we'll come back to it over the next week or two to kind of keep a chat in terms of uh what's happening on on dairy farms so so folks that's that's it for this week um we've had a a good breeding special action packed from from all sides and from all parts of the country um again thanks to fbd msd animal health or nua and borbia for helping us make this outside broadcast happen um again remind viewers and listeners that you know we we, we do speak to uh, borbia and to mick Houlihan from the kind of quality assurance side of things because there was a lot of changes in that space this week and there's going to be more changes next week and in the weeks to come in terms of the whole new sustainability program that was the front page story on the journal this week so keep an eye on that and uh, keep in touch and if you have any queries please please um please get them into us and we'll 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 do our best to answer them and the team will kind of from from whatever angle it is so thanks for that and make sure to watch the other session if you want uh, we'll be in touch stay safe and safe farming